Hi, I'm Andy Pallain and this is The Service Design Show. In The Service Design Show, we talk to people that are shaping the service design field. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments and the challenges up ahead. My guest in this episode is Andy Pallain. Andy is currently the design director at Fjord in Australia, and he is the co-author of the book called Service Design from Insights to Implementation. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be discussing a few topics, among them the fractal nature of service design and what service design can learn from the movie industry. So if you're interested in how to design services from end to end, be sure to stick around till the end of the episode. Welcome to the show, Andy. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, you're the second one uh, from Australia, actually, uh, being on the show. Well, it's uh, middle of the night here, so it's looking a bit kind of dingy yeah. and dark. If we did it the other way around, it'd be more nice and sunny and you'd be all in the, <laughs> in the dark. Maybe the next time. Andy, um, you've been quite uh, uh, active in the service design field for quite a while. But do you actually recall your very first memory of service design? I do actually. So uh, I have to sort of rewind the history a bit, um, a little bit. So I was mainly working doing interaction design and teaching interaction design, and um, and I go my that, my history in that goes back right to the early nineties. And I think I'd often thought in this way. Um, I remember doing some work back in the nineties for um, a bank, a major UK bank, when I was at Razorfish, and thinking about the design of of services. Mm -hmm. And then when I was um, teaching at the College of Fine Arts here, I was the head of School of Media Arts here in Australia uh, back in the 2000s, we were restructuring the faculty. And I remember being struck by the fact that a lot of people were sitting around uh, the meeting table reading bits of paper out at each other. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, at least half of us are designers here and the rest are artists. Why aren't we up at the whiteboard designing? This yeah. is a design problem. Yeah. And I started thinking about the design of organizations. This is around 2000, 2001. And in that company that I had worked, I'd, I'd set up a company years ago, or co-set up a company called Antirom in the very early 90s. And a guy that I uh, worked with us then was a guy called Ben Reason. Mm -hmm. And anyway, in one trip back to London, I, I dropped by to uh, say hi to Ben in the studio. And I think I met Lavrand and also Chris there. I think I met Chris and Ben. And um, Ben said, well, we're doing this thing called service design. We just set up this company about a year ago. And as he started describing the kind of work they were doing, I was like, oh, all right. So that way of thinking has a name. And I think that's quite a common story for a lot of people that get yeah. involved in this. Yeah. So this was uh, for the people who don't know who Ben is. The co-founders of LiveWork, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So th this must be back in 2001, two, three, something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. I think it's 2001, 2002, something like that. Yeah, really the early days of the, uh, the field. Yeah. All right. So um, in the show, we have a question format that is based on co-creation, as we believe in co-creation and service design. And uh, maybe uh, not all the people who are watching this episode have seen any of the previous episodes. So let's explain shortly how it works, right? I have three topics uh, on a stack of papers, and you also have a stack of papers, right? Can you pick uh, one that is in front of you? I can indeed. Uh, I'm on, I, yeah, can I so, use them more than once? Yeah, the, you have a why, and I call these question starters, which you have. I'll pick a topic and you'll uh, associate the question starter with that and then you have to answer your own question. It's that easy. Okay. Ready? Easy enough. Easy enough. So uh, um, I'll start with um, the one that puzzles me the most because I have no clue what you mean with this one and it's called the fractal nature. What is the question <laughs> starter that goes along with that one? Mm. Actually, right. no, like, I won't do that. No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, look, we'll, we'll say this, actually, because maybe how much is, is partly what that relates to. So what is the question based on how much? <clears throat> how much can service design achieve? And how actually, th there's one that's missing here, which is how far can it go? Um, and that's the, the question. And that's what relates to the fractal nature of service design. Explain because I'm still puzzled. <laughs> so um, I did a talk 
um, for uh, Rosenfeld Media is a, 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 a webinar and it was about the future of UX or UX futures. Uh, and in fact, it's a talk I'm going to do here at Service Design Australia soon. And it is uh, about the powers of 10. Now, I don't know if people remember this. Uh, there was a, a very famous video uh, film and a, a book actually by the Eames, uh, Rand Charles Eames, um, about the, uh, they start with a camera above someone's hand and they zoom out one meter and it's someone lying on a picnic blanket in a field. And then they zoom out one, uh, another, another power of 10, so 10 meters, 100. And very quickly yeah. they're, in the, they're in the universe and solar system. And then they go the other way and they go right back down to the atomic level. And it was a really fascinating idea of just adding a zero each time mm -hmm. and then illustrating it. And um, my dad had this book when I was a kid and I used to love looking through it. And one of the things I often think about with service design is how fractal it is. So you can look at um, a small part of a service. Let's say, uh, let's use a, a telco because it's a good, a good example yeah. of a sort of classic service. So you can look at um, me trying to set up my um, router at home, okay? And that's a little bit of the service. Or I can look at the next level up, which is me getting my home line installed. Mm -hmm. Or I can look at the next thing up, which is perhaps um, my whole kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. with that telco. Mm -hmm. Or the next uh, level out, might, you might think about the entire sort of life cycle or lifespan yeah. I have as a customer. Or you might think of my entire lifespan as a human being. Right? And then... A telco obviously has existed beyond before I was born and it will exist after I've, I've died. So one of the things that happens, I think, with service design that's um, a really tricky thing to navigate is what level of that kind of fractal universe are we at? Because right down to uh, an individual touch point, yeah. so the buttons on an interface, yeah. You're still affecting the service. So if one of those things doesn't work and it causes a lot of people, or a classic one with telcos is people don't understand their bills, right? The so people don't understand their bills. Loads of people call the call center to query it. It costs the telco a lot of money, but then at the same time, um, it's blocking up that call center for other people who might actually have a different kind of problem. And so often there's a, the, the, it's the butterfly effect, right? So you have one little thing here and, it, you, and it's causing a little bit of a ripple. And when it's magnified across the whole ecosystem of a service, uh, it creates a lot of pain and it can be incredibly expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, service design is very fractal in the sense that you, you kind of work out what level are we working at and then you're, you design at that level. But sometimes you drop down into the details and sometimes you blow up to the big picture. And you have to kind of be able to rapidly move between those um, and think in that, in that way. So, so, so yeah, you, you mentioned this design. as a topic that is, uh, you are thinking about, what is the question that you have about this topic? So the question is, and I don't even know if it has to be a question, but the question is, where does service design begin and end? Um, now, we work at Fjord with a whole bunch of other people in Accenture, for example, and our clients. And um, one of the things that there's often a discussion about is where does strategy start and then, then service design and is there then design realization as a separate thing and then delivery mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. And I, this comes on to the other question, actually, I believe it's end to end. Right? I think if you reposition a, um, if a, str a strategist or the, the business guys reposition a brand, in the market, they're redesign or they're designing the service. And if a coder down one end decides to change the wording on a button because it's too long, they're designing the service too. Um, right, they're wrapped into some of the sort of public stuff, into uh, government policy and things like that. So my, I, I kind of don't think it ends, but I think it. Um, I think you have to have an awareness of where you are. And to have that awareness, I guess you have to understand the whole you have to see the bigger picture. You do. And, and the, the trick is also then in, in, on a project is to know, well, what, uh, what can I actually design? And what's a thing I can actually affect and have some kind of intervention in as a designer? What stuff do I need to know is affecting my uh, gravitational field or whose gravitational field is affecting mine, right? So yeah. I mean, it's orbit in some way. And what stuff is just out there in the world? Um, that I need to be aware of. 
rectal nature of service design. Really interesting. I think a lot of people recognize this, what you're saying, but never have put this this context that it's uh, about design of a touch point uh, to the design of basically yeah, maybe the whole company. It makes it yeah, pretty complex also. It makes it super it complex. It does, right? And so, so that's, and that's the tricky bit. You know, you, there's an expression in English, I don't know if you've heard it, um, called boiling the ocean. And um, I think a lot of projects are pitched or, or try to boil the ocean. Like we're going to fix poverty yeah. with yeah. service design. And you, know, you just can't. So you have to work out, well, which, which bit of the ocean are we going to put in a little yeah. pot and boil? Yeah. Um, and then when we do it enough, then we have perhaps boiled most of the ocean. Um, but it, it's, it's not possible to, to do it. But I think you still need to have this way of holding those two things in your head. One, that, that detail and the big picture, but yeah. not let them kind of confuse each other. Yeah. And a lot of the kind of stress on tension on projects is people at different levels. So people think, well, we're, no, we're designing this big thing. And someone else going, no, we're not. We're designing the small thing. And as in fact, both those things are the service. And they just need to know that they're at different levels. Yeah, and they're con they should be contributing to the same goal. Eventually, yeah, that should be yeah. the the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, all right, you've touched up on uh, a second topic, and uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll hold it up, uh, and let's see if you can add a question started to this one that uh, broadens our perspective on service design uh, is end to end. We have a question started that goes along with this one. And where we can yeah. add something valuable to, uh, to the conversation. So that's this one, okay? So let's go for how can we. So what would be the question? So how can we design services end-to-end? -end? Um, and it, it relates to what I was just talking about, that um, there's, a, there's quite a big challenge as service design and some of the sort of projects we work on at a pretty large scale so particularly some of the stuff that we work on with very large companies enterprises or with um with public services which are enormous yeah. and complicated yeah. they have hugely um complicated technical architectures at the back end some things that are really kind of ancient um and so there's this tension where you kind of want to do something amazing and you have this whole kind of strategy and we do a whole discovery and understand the user's needs and see, oh, well, this is where we need to be. And then you have to make sure that that central focus of what people actually need remains intact all the way through a, a process that might go through sort of a huge uh, delivery teams some working in waterfall, some working in agile, yeah, some yeah. working in, there's a thing called safe, which is this scaled agile framework, um, and make sure it doesn't sort of just get completely degraded as it, uh, as it goes. Um, so th that's, that's quite a challenge. That's quite a challenge for, um, service designers and people working on service design projects. It's actually uh, a challenge for everyone in the team because it, there's a tendency to, I say everyone in the team, I mean mm -hmm. by the, the entire mm -hmm. project. There's a tendency to fall back on the stuff you know. There's a tendency for a lot of stuff to um, fall through the cracks. And all of a sudden you've end up, ended up making a thing that isn't the thing that you initially said you were going to make. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a, a shadow of what it was intended yeah. to be. Yeah. I th and this is, of course, a trap in a lot of projects. But do you have some... Um, um, best practices or examples that you've seen where uh, they've been able to cope with this? I have some examples that I can't tell you about, but I, uh, the, this is actually one of the frustrations about service design, I find, is a, because a lot of our work is spent doing the, a lot about the thinking up front, and often the, it's quite long-term, so yeah. if, uh, if you're changing the culture of a, a company, which is one of the things we'll come to, or you're, you're um, working on a large scale thing, it's, it's years often before it really kind of flows out into the market. So you can't, I can't talk about a lot of it. Um, but when it works well, there's this trifecta, there's the, there's, um, and it's, it relates completely to the desirable, um, feasible, feasible and um i've completely forgotten the other one yeah. a desirable feasible and um 
I'm blanking out too. Uh, I'm not out to cut viable. But, viable, yes. Desirable, feasible, and viable. So, which is design, business, and technical, right? So, you know, viable. Um, you know, is it, is it going to have a legs as business? Technical, is it going to be feasible? And desirable is the design part, right? So when those remain intact and um, work across all the way through the project, then I think that's when you have the best chance. And actually, the best example I have comes completely outside of uh, service design, which is uh, the world of filmmaking. So in filmmaking, you traditionally, that's what I, what I originally studied, and I think that's why I have this in my head. In filmmaking, you traditionally have a, 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 the, the sort of three pillars of director, cinematographer, and producer. So the producer is the money guy. The director is keeping the vision, what we would see as service design vision of you know what's the whole kind of purpose and of this. And the cinematographer is in charge of how it looks. Yeah, more or less. It's yeah. obviously yeah. more complicated than that. And what happens is they kind of make, they go through an iterative process. So you make the film over and over and over again. So it first gets made by the screenwriter, and then it gets made again as a, as a storyboard, and then it gets made again. Um, in multiple iterations of that and then it gets made again actually you shoot the stuff and you you make this huge thing and then you edit it down again it gets remade again Mm -hmm. in the edit suite Mm -hmm. and often it you know takes root in the kind of public uh, public imagination so you get this co-created sense of what the film actually is and what they managed to do is take a logistically really complicated process in a feature film there's hundreds thousands of people involved in making it and it's there's a lot of money riding on it. So the business part of it is really important. Uh, technically, sometimes it's really difficult. Yeah. And they manage to keep, more or less, they manage to keep a vision of the final experience. That's what they're all focused on is people sitting in the cinema. So the money people are focused on it. Are people going to go and see this and tell their friends? Um, you know, the director's obviously focused on it. And, and so as the cinematographer, is this going to draw people in? Are we going to be in, engaged? So they managed to keep that structure all the way through. Uh, and the sort of weighting of who has, who has the most weight, if you like, and, they, and the checks and balances between them all, um, when it works well, it works all the way through the yeah. process. And obviously you hear films going kind of over budget and going crazy and the director going off, off the deep end and so forth. But um, in general, it's always struck me that they managed to do something that's quite similar to what we do in service design. And they've got a long kind of production process uh, history behind it. So are we, are we missing the director in a lot of service design projects? Or are the, does the director just step out uh, of, uh, of the picture service design? So I, I know I think a lot of service designers would love to think of themselves as the director. Um, but actually, you know, the director is one piece in, in the film thing. The director is a very important piece. But one piece of the whole puzzle, you know, you need to have everyone doing their bit. And it's one of those things a bit like music or playing in a band or an orchestra. You know, everyone has to do their part really well. But if one person rides over the Mm. top of someone else, uh, it sometimes doesn't work. So there are times when the director really wants to do something and the producer will just go, we don't have the budget. And they have to creatively work around it. and, And they'll often come up with something better because of the restrictions. And there are other times when the, the argument is, no, this absolutely has to happen. And so they then have to go and get more money. Um, I think in service design, what tends to happen is it's as if people have written the script and gone through the storyboarding and uh, started shooting. And then the director just disappears. Exactly. And then you just That's, leave yeah, it. You yeah. know. So the, but, but everyone actually, so, so loads of people just then step out of the process. Yeah. And you're left with... I mean, an editor is a creative person anyway, but it's almost as though you're, you're left with, you're leaving the editor, um, or not even the editor, someone who's just cutting together stuff uh, kind of in a dark room, not knowing, is this the right thing? Sure, uh, yeah. I need to cut together. Yeah. And, th- th- and that's something that, that we have to really watch out for. Interesting metaphor. And I, uh, I've, I've already said a few times here to our clients that, uh, if you look at your own service uh, as a movie, do you consider it to be a blockbuster or is it a bad B horror type experience where people get into? So I think it's a really strong metaphor. <laughs> yeah. I think it's useful because people understand it from popular culture too. Yeah. And anything that kind of takes it away from some obscure kind of methodology uh, and 
and any of those things i think kind of helps yeah all right so andy uh, i've got one left here and <clears throat> this one is a topic that uh, that is really a recurring uh, pattern in uh, the episodes and um, you call this one design from within yes um i don't know what to uh well let's say who are let's go for that as who are is my question to that who are or who is doing design from within so um fjord do these uh trends we do a, a set of trends release a set of trends every uh, every year and they're crowdsourced from within fjord so we uh, there's about 750 of us around the world and it's always very fascinating and um, one of the things that I'm involved in and as part of your evolution and one of the things that we see over and over again is a question that starts often um, from clients, which is having worked with you, could you teach us to do what you do? How could you teach us to do what you do? And that ranges. So you have at one end, the argument for design thinking in you know in companies has kind of been one, right? So there's not many people going, why should we do design thinking? Maybe at the most sort of immature end of the spectrum in terms of an organization's evolution is we know we think we want to do some design thinking, but we we sort of you know what would it look like? Yeah. Most of the time though, they're coming to us saying, um, can you can you teach us about service design and and service design thinking and doing? right the way through to uh, we already have a team in-house um, and we'd like you to to assess them and teach them and and get them to have a shared language and set of methodologies and sometimes um, we want to set up a design team in-house yeah. and I'm talking here so banks and telcos and be, you know enterprises that aren't design companies or design led yeah. uh, and so that design from within of, of there's a, there's a, I see if, um, there's probably the other bit is what if here, right? So there's who are and what if. There's a question for us right, of, of what happens when, when that, when they do that. Um, and in some respects, you know, are we putting ourselves out of, the, out of business by, by helping our clients do this? I don't think we are. Well, I don't um, think, yeah. No. But um, the other thing is kind of, who are they and where do they exist inside an organization is a thing that a lot of companies are struggling with so uh, what um, is your current observation well one thing is that um one size fits all doesn't it doesn't work right so there's not a single solution it really depends on the history of that company and the way it's, it's structured we also have found that to put them in their own group sort of as a independent department doesn't work either because mm -hmm. as you, you know the the number one thing and all of your guests have also said this about breaking down silos right so to build another one with this design in it doesn't really work yeah so sometimes they become a kind of hub so or a filtration device uh, device through through which a lot of other projects go um if they're happening within a bank or a telco or whatever um and they help those project teams make sure that they're what they're doing is customer centered mm -hmm. human centered um and connected in a service design way um sometimes so my wish for it really is that that just becomes the new normal the new way of just it's just the way we do things and it doesn't even have to have a kind of separate name yeah. anymore yeah in the way that kind of maybe business is such a kind of loose nondescript word that that's just design should be business as usual yeah right? That's um, and until we get there, we have we still have a lot of work to do. I'd say. Yeah, there's a lot of cultural change, and some some industries and some kinds of uh, companies. That's why the, the one size fits all doesn't really work. They have a lot of different backgrounds and histories, and some 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 places it's just like kind of you're pushing on an open door, or there's a real desire and appetite for it within the organisation. They just don't quite know how to kind of put it all together. Um, and in some cases, the the organisation just is is really hostile to the idea, um, and it's usually somewhere in between. So people kind of most people want to change, right? Most people like the idea of change and like you present them a vision of what life might be like. They like the idea of it. They usually like it when they've got there. Um, what they hate is actually changing, yeah, because right? so, it's a really yeah. painful, horrible yeah. process usually. Because there's a, a point in it where you feel all at sea. 
So a large part, I guess, of our work is to help them uh, take that journey and sort of hold their hand for a bit of it and then, and then gradually let go. So, so being a part of this process, what would be your biggest insight from the last two years, I'd say, to make this transition easier? Um, one is that it has to have buy-in from really high up. You can't have the C-suite kind of sending a, uh, a message well, so there's often a dichotomy. So the C suite's often sending out their kind of strategic vision message, which is we want to be customer centric, we want to break down silos and so forth. And yet they make their staff work in a really siloed yeah. ways in, in 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 spaces that are very siloed with cubicles and, and people in different departments and so forth. And so that's so that's the kind of body language that they're saying there, which is we we're saying this thing over here, but actually we're not making it happen. Uh, and that needs to change. And, though, and so you need to have that support from very, very high up. Otherwise, it just gets a bit cynical. Um, and the other thing, I think, is to start small. You know, the, the biggest fear, you know, the, the classic, you know, um, a, new, a journey starts with the first step. I think the, the biggest thing that's a problem is if, if an organization or someone at the top says, right, we're going to change from being what we are now to in, it, within the next year, we're going to become completely human-centered, design-centered, yeah. design-led, the antibodies of that organization are just going to kind of react too quickly and, and lock it all down. It's much, much better to have a small success and then that creates a little gravitational pull for more people and then you, they get bigger success and gradually it just becomes the way of working. Yeah, but <clears throat> I, I fully agree with you and this is also one of the topics I, I discussed in one of the previous episodes with Dave Gray. But the hard part about making it small is that uh, for C-suite people, uh, celebrating small successes is not as attractive <laughs> as celebrating big successes. So that, that, that's my experience, at least, that tends to slow down the process. Right. So having, it's very true, but having a kind of roadmap um, then is, is you know, we, and that's one of the things we often end up doing is, is putting together that roadmap of, well, this is the, you know, I was saying about not boiling the ocean, right? Yeah. So this is the big thing. This, and this is where we're going to go to, but let's, we're going to go here first and gradually kind of move towards that. Um, then you kind of keep the big strategic vision intact, but you don't try and do it all in one go. Yeah. Be you know, because sometimes those, those managers then go somewhere else, right? And then, and then you've got that whole cycle of someone else coming in and going, well, we're not going to do what the last guy did. We're going to scrap it and, you know, and then start again. So it has to really become part of the DNA for change to actually happen. And that takes time and patience. It, yeah, it does take time. And it takes, um, sometimes it takes a generational shift as well. I mean, re really, uh, some people have to retire, you know, and then new people come through and they've, they've got a different kind of view of things. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, Andy, we are uh, sort of uh, heading to the end of our talk already, and um, I'm. Um, my question would be: You would have to give people a tip, people that want to get into service design. What would be your most valuable tip for them? Well, I'm going to steal one from a designer called Brendan Dawes. Um, and he once said, if you want to be a more interesting designer, become a more interesting person. Because I think that most of the people who I, when I interview people and the people I'm kind of looking for are, have two, two key abilities. One is uh, they don't really fit in anywhere else. So almost always when someone says, well, I go, so what do you do? And they go, well, I, you know, I, I do this one thing over here. But I do this other thing over here and I really see the relationship between the two, but no one else ever seems to. And I haven't really ever found the role that suits me. Um, they, I often want to hire them because they, they kind of get it. Um, and then the second thing is, is the, this ability to see patterns quickly and to, uh, to understand the connections and, and to be able to go from that mentally to flip backwards and forwards between that, that small detail and that big picture and do it very high frequency and be comfortable kind of moving backwards and forwards. Those are the, the two skills. And my opinion is, having taught master's and bachelor's students to, I kind of think if you haven't already got that kind of mind uh, at, from, at school, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to learn it later on. Uh, you know, you can, 
I can teach you about the service design. I can teach you lots of methods. I can teach you stuff, uh, you know, to actually do the work. But yeah. the, the kind of yeah. way of thinking yeah. sort of needs to be there oh, already. Is. And I, ha- I haven't really sussed out exactly where it happens yet. Yeah, it's, it's about the attitude. Yeah, it is. It's about the way you see the world, actually. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I'm I'm guessing. I really am guessing that it happens at a much younger age than certainly than at university. Yeah. So I I've talked uh, uh, quite a few times about design education, um, but maybe design education should start way way earlier than we're approaching it now. Well, you know, John uh, Don Norman wrote a piece recently about. Um, you know, design thinking and design, and it was talking about how designers could really do with a um, more STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math in their in their world, and kind of the way they think and stuff. And I kind of felt like he had that backwards because education tends to get rid of the humanities and the arts, and certainly in places like the UK and and here in Australia, that that's happening terribly, and. Arguably, design thinking is actually a sort of band aid for the, the lack of that at school because everyone gets STEM at school, it gets shoved down your throat. And I yeah. think it's important, yeah. I do think it's important, but I think the other part's important too. And so, I think it's funny to see design thinking coming into sort of business later on as, as, as like a sort of compensation for that lack you know, mm. in school days. So, um, if we would have to wrap this uh, talk up and this would be your opportunity to ask the people who are listening or viewing this episode right now what would you ask them i would ask them what would i ask the people who are listening to this episode right now um god that's such a tough question that's (laughs) perhaps the toughest question i've ever been asked um I think I'd want to ask them about their, their lives, actually. I mean, I always just am really interested in people's lives and really interested in um, the way they see the world and why they see the world that way. So it's the whole sort of mental models thing. And um, the details of the kind of pains in their lives, because pains are always frustrated needs, right? And then frustrated needs are always opportunities for something. So. Um, I, I love hearing people's stories and I guess I would just ask them to tell me their stories share your stories in the comments that would be uh, really interesting yeah absolutely well uh, let's hope a lot of people do that uh, Andy uh, thank you for uh, taking the time in the evening in Australia to be a guest on our show it's a pleasure thank you very much for having me here I've enjoyed yeah. it very much uh, let's hope we meet physically uh, uh, one day soon I'm sure we will. Thanks, uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye.